Chieftain was the main battle tank of the British Army throughout the late of the Cold War period. It was developed in the early 1960s and replaced in frontline service both Centurion and Conqueror. Basically what you had was you had a gun that was as good as Conqueror's 120, if not slightly better, as well as being a lot more mobile, a lot smaller, lighter, and uh, just as heavily armoured, if not more so. Chieftain was innovative for a couple of reasons, but the primary one was the fact that this was now the first battle tank where the driver sits in a semi-reclined position. Instead of sitting upright like you would if you were driving a car or indeed any previous tank, the driver is now more or less half lying down on his back. This means that there is no longer a requirement to keep the hull high to fit him. At this point, the technology of the engine's powertrains had developed to the extent that the driver was now the highest thing in the hull. Vehicles ever since then have generally had a reclining driver's position and was far and away the biggest gun in NATO at the time and it remained so until the advent of the German 120mm smoothbore in 1979. Chieftain continued the horseman bogey suspension system as found on Centurion but the engine was upgraded. No longer did they have the Meteor engine. Uh, we now had a Leyland L60 multi-fuel. This thing would run on anything. Uh, however, it was also the Achilles heel of the tank. Uh, the tank was known for driving around everywhere in a big cloud of blue smoke. So it was a bit of a signature, I guess, if you couldn't see the dust trail. And frankly, it wasn't the most reliable engine either. They tended to break down from time to time. But if the wagon got to where it was going, you now had a low profile, heavily armored tank with a whopping gun. I love this tank. It just looks like a tank should look. It's, uh, it's a case where I'm gonna sit on this hill, try and take it from me. And indeed, so well respected was Chieftain that uh, the Soviet forces in Germany put their best tanks, the T-64, up against the Chieftains and not against the Patons and Leopards found further south. The British Army of the Rhine were a tough nut to crack with this tank. For all the advancements though, this was still a second generation tank. You have basic cast armor, no fancy composites or anything else like that. For night vision on the left hand side of the turret is a very large searchlight, white light or infrared. Let's find your target. To range the target, there was a coaxial ranging machine gun, basically a 50 caliber machine gun, fired three round bursts with exploding tip ammunition and tracer. And you would bracket the target. You would shoot long, shoot short, shoot center. And then when you had the range, you pushed the big button. The ammunition, fin, hesh, British love hesh, uh, smoke. The rounds are three piece ammunition. Everybody thinks of them as two, really it's technically three. First part is a projectile. Now if it's an inert round like the armor piercing, they are scattered around inside the turret in the bustle, close to hand. Explosive rounds such as Hesh would usually be stowed in a safer position below the turret ring. Now the next part of it was the propellant charge. These were bagged charges, the entire charge would be consumed. They were stowed in armored bins around within reach of the loader. The third part was the vent tube. It looked a lot like a 50 caliber blank round. And this was basically the primer. They were fed through a 10 round magazine. So the loader generally only had to load projectile and charge, arm the cannon, and his job was done. Now, every 10th round, he would have to change the magazine out as well. There were a couple of advantages of this. One was that there were no spent casings lying around because all that was left was a little 50 cal type the vent tube. The other advantage was that you could now lap load. Uh, 105 this wasn't a problem either. Now what lap loading is, is you are holding the next round in your hand, ready for the gun to fire as soon as it fires, you throw the next round in, you're loaded, and while the gunner is servicing the target, you grab the next round. This is not permissible with modern Smoothbore 120 ammunition because the shell casing will consume itself in the process of firing. It is somewhat combustible. It is dangerous to lap load your rounds. With the three-piece ammunition, however, especially if you're firing in the fin rounds, you could lap load because there is nothing to explode if you're holding the projectile. So as soon as the breach is open after uh, recoiling, you can immediately throw in the next shell 
and not have to worry about waiting for ammunition doors to open or anything else like that. Then the bagged charge is very small and light, at least compared to an entire round, so it doesn't take him all that long to grab that out of stowage and throw that in afterwards. So in practical terms, the rate of fire of the multiple piece ammunition in the British tanks is actually about the same as that of a one piece uh, ammunition on say Leopard 2 or M1. And of course bear in mind, this came out 20 years before the Abrams. In addition to the ranging machine gun, there's two other 762s, uh, there's coaxial and the commander had one in his cupola. Commander on the right hand side had controls to traverse the turret himself and engage targets if he needed to. And of course the gunner had his own controls for the forward. Uh, basically it was a joystick which would come left, right or forwards or backwards. His left hand controlled the trigger and that also had the coaxial main gun toggle and safety. And of course he also has manual controls should there be a failure in the power supply. Wrapped around the gun tube is a canvas shroud. This is a thermal shroud to equalize the temperature of the gun tube no matter what's happening or how many rounds you fire, what the weather is like. Most other guns the shroud is fiberglass or of similar nature. The British however use canvas through until uh, they got Challenger 2. At the very end of the muzzle, you're going to see a muzzle bore sight device. This little tube is an alignment system that you can match up with your gun sight to make sure that the cannon is actually aiming where you think it's firing. Driving Chieftain is actually a hell of a lot of fun. It's, it's the first tank I ever drove. So you're sitting down, uh, you have your tillers to control your steering, nothing particularly unusual there. You have an accelerator pedal, big huge thing, has two positions, more revs and idle. Gear changes are interesting, it's done much like a motorcycle, a semi-automatic system. You lift your left foot up to go up a gear, you shove your toes down with your left foot to go down a gear. And there's no smooth gear changes, I mean just kind of semi-automatic lurch and away you go on your next gear. At the front of this vehicle is a mine plow. It's one of the various ways of getting through a minefield. Now the way this works is you stop maybe about 100 yards before where you think the minefield is you lower the plow. As you can see from the skids on the end, it doesn't go down that deep, maybe 8 to 10 inches. Anything more than that is not going to be a threat to the tank. When it encounters a mine, one of two things will happen. Either the mine will detonate, which is actually not healthy for the plow. You can only do a couple of strikes before you have to replace your plow. Uh, the other thing it might do is just shove the mine off to the side, which is fine. However, if the mine does detonate, you also want to make sure it doesn't damage your gun. So when you go through a minefield with the plow down, you have to protect the gun by turning the turret to the left hand side. This also brings the TC forward so we can see what's happening. Now here's the catch. There's two of these in a squadron of vehicles. It's a company size element, British Army terms. And two of them have the plows, ten of them don't. Which one are you going to shoot at first? Well, you're going to shoot at the ones with the plow. And guess where the thickest armor is on your tank? Well, it's the front of your turret, which you've just turned over to the side so that your gun doesn't get blown up. So you have to do a lot of supporting assets before you can just drive forward with your plow, drop plow, and go through the mine. You gotta suppress the enemy, you gotta obscure the point of penetration. The combined arms breach, which this is basically a part of, is the epitome of modern warfare. If you can do one of those, it's deemed that you've grasped a lot of the concepts of modern warfare. In addition to servicing the main gun, the loader does have the most important job on the tank, as any British tanky will tell you, is manning the boiling vessel. This is basically a tea maker. And uh, his job is to boil water for the tea, or you can use it for soup, or whatever else you want, but it is warm. Important criterion when you're sitting in the rain in Germany. So this is the famous BV, the boiling vessel that you always hear British tankies talk about, especially Challenger, my European counterpart. They say it's the most important piece of equipment on Chieftain. Today's Abrams tankers will be vaguely familiar with We have actually poached the design and taken it ourselves. It is quite simply a tin, which goes into a water heating element. Plugs into the tank's electrical system. You can boil water. You can even fry stuff in this. But you're boiling the bag MREs or C rations soup, tea, what have you. Close it up and you can cook it under pressure. Nice and warm, there's a little tap at the bottom here for dispensing your hot water. Faucet if you prefer. And that's it. On the Abrams today you'll find it at the Lotus Feet, Bradley's have one at the back right, almost identical design. 
On each side of the turret, you're going to see the smoke grenade launchers. Uh, this will basically provide an immediate smoke screen. The original grenades would fly out, land on the ground, and produce smoke from the ground up. Later model grenades in use today will be ejected from the same launcher, but they will detonate in mid-air and thus create an instant smoke screen. This tank has been upgraded partially. Where the ranging machine gun was is now simply welded over plate. However, there were further upgrades, which we're going to have a look at right now. One of the interesting features of Chieftain is that its service life started to cross the gap between the second and the third generation tank. So now we've moved to a Mark 12. This is still basically the same Chieftain hull and engine, except there have been a couple of modifications made. It's had extra armor added to it. It's called Steel Brew. It is not composite like it is on a third generation tank, or at least most third generation tanks, but it is still additional designed to keep pace with developments in Eastern Bloc technology. Most significantly on the left-hand side of the turret, the big infrared white light searchlight has been removed. It's been replaced by the TOGS, the Thermal Observation Gunnery System. Uh, this allows a true all-weather, all-night or dark capability uh, commensurate with modern tanks of today. So as part of the upgrade process for this tank, the old joystick that used to be up here has been replaced now by a fixed grip and the turret is now controlled by a thumb switch, pretty much similar to Challenger 2 today. The advantage of this theory is that as the gunner is being thrown around going off country, um, his hand is fixed in place relative to the tank. He's not inputting false inputs, and his thumb is usually re reasonably stable compared to his hand as well. His left hand remains with the same fixed grip, which is also the safety with the coaxial or main gun toggle switch. Other than that, the gun remains the same. This particular one has had the thermal shroud removed, so you see simply the gun barrel itself. That's why it looks a little bit different. Engine remains the same. It's still the same liability of the Chieftain tank. Uh, suspension remains the same. Track remains the same. Increased lethality because it can see further, it can shoot further, it is more accurate, it has a proper integrated fire control system. An additional feature that's been added to this particular vehicle, it could be added to other Chieftains, is the dozer blade. It is powered. Power cables come here and go into a juncture box here under my right foot. And as a result, it is a way of extending Chieftain's service life. Now it turned out at the end of the Cold War, there was no longer any requirement to keep Chieftain in service. Enough Challengers and Challenger 2s had been built that it made the upgrade program for Chieftain redundant. So the Mark 12 you see here is one of the last that they made. 